Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're having a second look, uh, another submission by Louise and her horse, Mozart. And I have to say here, right off the bat, what a great job she is doing here. And much improved since the last time I saw you. Now, the one thing I would say, it's kind of interesting here that you start with the lunging. I, it's probably better to start with the work in hand. But if you're doing that for some reason, for instance, like you have a young horse that's just too fractious to be able to work in hand, you just have to, you have to work on them down a little bit. Um, but normally you're going to get better um, lunge work if you do the work in hand first and get the horse really swinging over its back and then go on to the lunge line. So think about that for next time. But this is getting to a really good place in, in all things, so I have no problem with any of this. Um, but just something to think about. Now there, when she gets to that walk, look how much difference it makes. These heavy horses, it's just, this is the only way that you can possibly train. There's the only way you can train any of them, really, but it's really the only way you can train these kind of horses and really get them over their backs and getting them moving. And you do have to take a little different approach to them. Um, in other words, you have to make them the best they can be, but that doesn't mean, you know, a lot of people get this idea that, you know, you have to push horses on all the time and get them active. Well, that only works to a certain degree, and with these really heavy kind of horses, that's why the walk, once again, is so important to get your work going in the walk. Because a lot of people I see uh, will get these kind of heavy horses, and they're trying to make them active, and they get them to the point where they're just kind of running them off of their feet, but it still doesn't look like much, if you will, because they're just not that great of movers, if you will, compared to what we're normally, uh, what we're used to seeing these days. But they can become really good movers if we get them athletic and built up, you know, so they're strong enough to be able to do this work. And the best way to go from that is just the walk. And again, if you can't get it right in the walk, there's no point in going on to the trot. You must get the walk working correctly. Now, once in a while, we ask for a little bit of trot, just like when we are working horses into the canter. We don't just keep cantering. If the horse has a bad canter, you bring it back into the trot. Well, if the horse has a bad trot, you bring it back to the walk. So just think of that. So we must get the walk right, and you're doing a very good job of here doing this. Because once again, with these big heavy horses, if we get them trying to just make them active, they just don't have enough movement, and their bodies are so heavy that it just runs them onto their forehand. Which every horse has a point at which if you go too fast, that's why we say we're always looking for the slowest stride with the deepest step. So we're covering the most ground efficiently, if you will. Which for this horse right now in its walk is really doing quite well. Looks like it could swing a little more active there, but... You know, most of the time this is going really well for what this horse is. And once again, see how the horse stretches almost all the way down. Look how much better the walk is. So once again, there is no such thing. Like right there, as soon as the nose gets all the way to the ground, the horse can finally pull its back up enough to begin to swing through the back and use those back muscles to help it uh, bring the hind legs forward. So that was really good. And once again, that example that there is no such thing as too low. I'm hearing people talk all the time about, well, you know, you can never stretch past the knees. And, and these are people who don't ever stretch their horses. So I'm sure with their horses, if they stretched them faster, they would feel terrible for a moment because they wouldn't know how to hold themselves up. And that's kind of what you have to think here is, remember what we are doing is giving the horse time to learn to hold itself up. So it can hold itself up and then it can start to hold us up. But if we start getting on it before it can even hold itself up, if you will, that is hold its back up, then what do you think is going to happen? It's never going to be very successful. Which is what starts so many horses today down the downward spiral that they end up with kissing spine at six and seven years old these days, which should never happen. But this horse is really starting to look good. We're seeing how we're already starting to see a little bit of pull up through the abdominal wall there. And by the end of this, it looks quite good. So remembering that most people that have back pain have back pain because they have no core. And it's the same thing. It's just to, you know, it's just on a four legged animal rather than a two. But our backs are subject to exactly the same thing theirs are. If, if, you know, it's always people that have no stomach muscles who complain of back pain all the time because, of course, if you let go of your stomach, which is why we'd never want a horse, the back is going to collapse. Well, the same thing happens to a horse. I mean, if you just think about it logically, you can pretty much, anything you know about, you know, fitness and correct movement and posture that you can apply to a person and all the concepts of Pilates, you just apply to a horse. That's all that we're really doing here. But unfortunately today, very few horses ever get a chance to be in, you know, 
to work over their backs in a way that will allow them to do this for years and years. I mean, when we think about all the trouble that it is to train a horse and the time it takes, you know, and the years you have to put in to get them right, you know, and you see how most horses today, people are expecting to get a couple of years of use out before the horse is no good anymore, especially if they're so-called dressage riders, which is the funniest thing, because, you know, obviously that's what dressage is supposed to be about, making them last as long as possible in a healthful way um, to train them. Unfortunately, our, the powers that be have lost all sight of that. But happy to say with everybody around the world that we see, you know, just like this person here, Louise is having a great time with her horse here and it's coming around. If you just know a few of these basic principles, you can certainly save yourself and your horse. And once you realize how easy it is, and I said no one ever goes back from learning. If you, ride, if you learn to ride like this, you'll never want to ride any other way. You'll get on people's horses that they think are fantastic and you know, they're just stiff upside down things that you go, well, why would you want to ride this? And they only do because they don't know any better, essentially. Most people have never been on a correctly trained horse these days because there are so few of them. But we have fabulous horses today. And once again, that's the really sad thing. We, we're breeding horses that should be super athletes and should last years and years, but they're all being forced into phony frames when they're three and four years old. And by the time they're seven or eight, they're already finished. When they should be just finishing growing. Remember, larger horses are, the bigger they are, the slower they grow, the more it takes. It's like an elephant. It takes years for an elephant to grow into its size. Really nice walk here. Once again, you can see how the horse is picking up its legs most of the time and putting them down. It gets a little slow there, but you do a good job of correcting it. And once again, same thing here. She starts to slow, so you step in and intercede a little bit. And in between, you do absolutely nothing. And that's exactly what we want to do when we ride. That's why we say uh, lunging is really riding from the ground, because we're doing exactly the same thing. Only we're using a whip and calling that our leg in this instance, and we still have contact with the bridle. So we're making the horse active from behind, stepping it up, asking it to engage through its back. Unfortunately, over the last few years, in the last 20 years, I saw, you know, the art of lunging decline to the point where, you know, veterinarians are telling people not to lunge their horses and telling people it makes them lame. Well, it certainly does. If you lunge a horse like a lunatic on the end of a line, completely upside down, it won't be long before the horse is lame. But if you think about how we're going about this here in such a logical order, giving the horse time to, to warm up and get its muscles moving correctly, as opposed to letting it run around like a lunatic or leap in the air, even worse. So we're teaching the horse good life habits, if you will. It's not that we're being strict about it, um, but we're teaching them just like a person. You know, people have to learn good life habits, like the need to exercise, the need to eat correctly, and all those sort of things. Well, horses are the same thing. They have to get into a lifestyle that is healthy for them. You know, if you encourage an unhealthy lifestyle, just like with your children, you'll have unhealthy children. Beautiful right there, and look how low that neck is to the ground. But notice the best movement, the best flexion of the hocks comes when this horse's nose is completely on the ground. And what that simply tells you is that's how little strength the horse has across its back. As the horse develops strength, it will naturally carry the neck up and out all by itself, but the movement will not be affected. The movement will stay the same and actually get better. That is the depth to which the horse tracks under the body and pushes up through the back. It's interesting today because in dressage, you know, I've realized, you know, people are always talking about thrust and they just don't understand what that thrust is. If the horse is hollow, the thrust doesn't do anything. It's, it, in other words, it's like having a rocket that's open at the top so the engine just doesn't go anywhere. It's just burning up the fuel. Well, that's exactly what happens when the horse is hollow. It may have a bunch of thrust like these horses we breed today that have so much hawk action, but it's a kind of thrust that will destroy itself. It's like having a car with a bent crankshaft. So if the rest of the engine's working well, but the crankshaft is bent, it's going to essentially blow up the engine. Well, that's what happens with horses. Same thing. If any part of it is, is moving incorrectly, it's going to affect every other part to some degree. That is, if the horse can't uh, 
allow itself to move the way nature intended, just like you and I. Try strapping your arms behind your back and go run and feel how much more difficult it is if you don't have your arms as counterbalances to swing. Well, the horse is the same way. So we have to find the speed, like with these big horses, that allows them to just get the best possible thing. And sometimes with the big ones, that may seem a little on the slow side. So in other words, there's never a time that we want to run horses off their feet you know, with the idea of making them go forward. You can't make a horse go forward, because forward means to engage forward from behind, not go faster. You know, sometimes we'll ask for a little more activity, and that activity, if, it, if we are able to channel it correctly, will become forward movement. That is, the horse will track deeper forward under its body. But forward does not mean to just run around fast. That's not what the old masters intended it to mean. And as I said, with these kind of big horses, it can be a mistake to try to make them too active because they are so heavy anyway. The inertia just drives them even more onto their forehand until they have enough strength to lift up their backs a little bit. So about the way you're working here, this one <clears throat> is just about exactly how I'd like to see it done with a horse of this size and weight and newness. Now remember, this horse has only been doing this, I think, four and a half, five months, she says here. So if that's all you've been doing, this is looking really good. And look how calm the horse is becoming. And that's the thing to realize, you know, um, especially for those of you who live in these cold climates where horses can come out very high. You know, it's so important that we teach horses not to injure themselves. Once again, that we teach them to make good life choices and learn themselves how to um, exercise themselves, if you will, and let them burn off that energy slowly. You know, horses were never in, you know, meant to be kept inside, if you will, by nature. So... You know, it's so important with horses that do live inside and in box stalls most of the time, you know, they learn not to just come out and go crazy. That's how most of them kill themselves. So we must teach, no matter how high they are, they must learn to come out and stay under control. That is to work within the parameters that we have set for them. And starts out with a little activity. Now, that was what we talked about there. I mean, she made the horse a little more active, and she got a little more walk. But she didn't keep keep going. That was not a great trot, but it had a little more activity, so it worked up the walk a little bit. So it's perfectly fine to do a little bit of that. That's that compromise. But we wouldn't want to do too much of it. Just enough to get the horse a little activated, so it gets a little more blood going, if you will. And then right back to the walk, where you got a very good stretch in the walk. Really good there. Notice it's when the horse's nose is almost on the ground. That's when you have that wonderful, what looks like effortless and forward rhythm swing, rather than that look like it's always trying to put the brakes on. Same thing there. That was okay to do that little bit of trot. Gave you a little more activity in the walk. I don't know if you're asking for that as he's just offering it, but that's really good one way or another. You're ending up in a good place. Now we can see this horse, once again, watching it go by in silhouette, we can still see that there's a little drop to the back and there's, you know, uh, and a, a little bit of a drop to the back that I'm saying there. And so we know this horse is going to spend some time and that is what makes sense that why the horse is so deep into the stretch there. It needs to be at that place in order to lift the back to the degree that it can. In other words, by pulling those withers coming up through the shoulders. And many of you who have been doing this for a while with these kind of horses have realized how completely different your horses look after a couple of years. These what, horses that tend to look like plow horses suddenly turn into looking like athletes. But they always have that little more tendency, you know, to go to fat as, as do all sort of cold, colder-blooded horses. And, you know, you can say the same thing about the people. There are people who have more of a tendency to gain weight than others. There, there are people who are built more heavily, big bone people, you know, and with a lot of muscle mass. And those kind of people, you know, you never see them as cross-country runners usually because they'd kill themselves if they tried to do it. Their body weight would break, them, would break their own bodies down. So also why it's so important for people who are big people to be as fit as possible, not have extra weight that they're driving down, having to carry, that is. Really nice in that stretch there. So 
So I was saying, let's look when you come by in silhouette here again. And you can see there's a little drop there, and then we can see there there was a, a little bit of drop in in front of um, the hips there, but that looks like it has actually improved, and all that should be nice and flat and straight. As I said, whenever you see these horses that the back goes back to that and there's a bump there at the hips, we know that's the beginning of kissing spine. That's the first thing that that should tell you is that you need to do a lot of groundwork with the horse that's looking like that if it hasn't already gone lame. And of course, the fact, the simple fact of how many horses today have kissing spine, it's an, literally an epidemic, is a testament to what the training has done, you know. We've let our training standards slip and our horses are suffering for it. The same thing here. It looks like you're getting a little bit active. But we can see that once again, when he is trotting most of the time there, it's it's kind of head up and it's a little bit hollow. It gets a little better there. You're doing a good job of being able to stay with him there, but you need to actually be going a little faster. That's the problem and let him go. So most of this work should really kind of be done on the lunge line. because It's really hard to keep up with a horse at the trot. You're doing a pretty good job of it there, though. But he actually needed to go um, to swing a little more, I felt like, and I think that would be difficult for you from the ground. But that little bit of trot did get you a little more active walk. So once again, doing a little bit of that is okay. But doing much more beyond that should really just be done on the lunge line because you're not going to be able to keep up with it and you'll have a tendency to, to hold them back a little bit when you need to be letting them move a little more when they're ready to do it. Really nice walk there, really good rhythm. Once again, see the horse is still picking those hind legs up. And I'm sure most of you remember most of these heavier type of horses when we first started this kind of work with them. You look at their back legs and there's no flexion in the hocks at all. They're literally they're dragging their legs along. So this, this for this type of horse is looking really good. And that's actually a nice swinging walk right there. Just exactly how you'd want it to be if you were riding the horse. And once again, making that point, that's the point of doing all this from the ground. So when you get up, the horse has an idea of what it is you want. You've already strengthened the back, hopefully to the degree. And if you find that you can't get this, then you, do, you would dismount and stop riding the horse until you have done enough strengthening that you get up there and pretty soon you're able to get a stretch like this. If the horse is strong enough, it will want to do it, especially if you've trained it to do this from the ground as well. Because it has figured out now how to make the work more comfortable for itself. And I think even feels good when you can see how much these horses, like when you watch Legolas after, you know, they're at the level that he is, you can see that he thoroughly enjoys his work. I mean, there's no, he has a beautiful expression on his face all the time and he's into it. It's his play for the day, you know, and just like people, we only need to do about an hour of exercise a day. That's all a horse needs to do either. I mean, we would prefer horses to be able to live out and eat off the grass all the time, but that's just impossible sometimes when it comes to, uh, you know, main ho maintaining riding horses. In California, it's impossible because there's no grass. You all know the fires that we've just gone through here. In fact, you hear me snuffling. My throat's a little clogged up still from all the fire we've been breathing here. But it looks like we're on the on the men now. <clears throat> nice. And once again, notice the difference. Just watch how the head goes up and down and what happens to the back and what happens to the swing of the legs. As the head goes out, up, you can see how the, the hocks stop flexing. You don't see that wonderful flex, step, 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 step. So that simply tells us that the horse isn't ready to bring the head that high and be able to maintain itself over its back. That's the basic principle that we follow for everything. It's so simple once you understand it. Once you understand that once, if a horse is not over its back, it cannot bend. So it's ridiculous to think about bending or try to force horses to bend uh, that are not that are not moving over their backs. As soon as they are moving over their backs, they can bend. It's simple, and they want to bend because it's a comfortable way for them to move. 
But if we stop them ever being able to lift the back, then we can never really get Ben. And then we start fighting with horses trying to get it to happen. And that never ends up in a good place. So you've done a wonderful job here. I hear it's been, uh, I think you're in Sweden. Um, you might be in Norway, I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, I hear it's been very wet and rainy over there. So once again, I applaud all you guys getting out there working in the, in the weather. So you've done a great job with this horse. I look forward to uh, seeing him again in the not-too-distant future. I think maybe we we'll start to see some under-saddle work before long and see if we can recreate this same walk that you're getting now under-saddle. So just keep up what you're doing. You're doing a great job, and it's looking really good. We want to see, once again, that back lift up a little bit at the base of the withers, and we want to see that belly begin to come up a little more than it has yet, but it will in the not-too-distant future. <laughs> my dog barking. Uh, anyway, great job. I'm going to sign out here and I'll see you soon.